person, your ambassador, and that he'd be your messenger. Lord, to help us to have um, hearts that would receive the message today, that you would be glorified through it, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning to Grace Harvest Baptist Church this morning. What a pleasure it is to be in God's house this morning. Usually, when I preach my first sermon, it's small in this, so, hey, I feel at home already, so it's pretty nice. I told Pastor Cal I could get used to preaching once on a Sunday real quick again, but I'm so glad you guys are here, and for you guys who are at home, um, welcome to Grace Harvest. Uh, and if you, is this the first time you've ever uh, listened to us, uh, tuned in with us? I hope that you come and visit us in person. You know, as we were singing those songs, I heard the worship team practice this morning uh, while uh, uh, before the service, and I just, I, lo I love the song selection uh, that we had. Um, you know, I couldn't help but think when uh, we sing the words, all I have is Christ, you realize that the only people that can say that and sing that uh, are the ones that belong to him, and we have no fear of death. I want, you to, I want you to listen to what I just said again. The reason we can sing, all I have is Christ, because we have no fear of this world and what this world can do for, to us. When we sing, you can keep this world and give me Jesus, it means you're not concerned with this world and you want Christ. You can say, as Paul says, and I would ask you this morning, how, how would you respond when the pastor says uh, to live as Christ, to die as gain? Do you have the same attitude that Paul had when he said it? I want you to think about it before you answer again, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Real quick, Paul is saying, as long as God uses me, I'm living for him. But it's my gain to be taken home. And see, we kind of got to flip backwards in a modern Christian mindset. It's like, well, God, you know, just you're okay and everything, but just leave me to my stuff here. Make sure that I get everything I want to done in this lifetime. Not so much concerned with him. You know, this week we laid to rest our sister uh, Amber Wyan, a member of this church for 12 years. Uh, we have prayed for her family. Um, we have prayed for her parents. Uh, no mother, no father should have to bury their 33-year-old daughter. No husband should have to bury his 33-year-old wife. And no children should have to sit in a funeral and listen to a preacher preach about the death of their mother. And yet... Death does not escape us. It will never escape us. As I said this past Friday, every one of us has an appointment with death unless the Lord comes back first. Are you ready for it? Are you ready? Are you, are you satisfied with where you are in the Lord? Or are you constantly fretting uh, about this life and worrying about what's going on here Instead of focusing on Christ. You see, because the Christian mindset should be one of, Lord, I'm here, use me. But the problem is that sometimes our faith is questioned. Our faith is questioned. What do I mean by that? I mean that sometimes, even in the midst of our walk with Christ, we can feel abandoned. It's amazing how God works in His sovereignty this is the 57th week I've been in the Matthew series, and as I began to study this on Monday, and I started to write my sermon, I couldn't help but notice that Matthew felt abandoned. Excuse me, John felt abandoned. And then I, and then I thought about all those that would come to the funeral on Thursday, Wednesday, I was up early in the morning praying, and let me tell you how sovereign our God is. I came in and told Pastor Cal the direction that I was going to go on Friday, and I was praying and, and asking God's wisdom, and he said, Pastor, the same time that you were saying that prayer, I was up at four in the morning praying for you. It's amazing how God's sovereignty will work, and, and uh, think about this. I preached on the abandonment Friday, and here we are, 
in the Gospel of Matthew, verses 1 through 6. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word, if you are able? When Jesus had finished instructing His twelve disciples, He went on from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Father God, no clear words of your son's right to be the Messiah were ever written than what we have just read out loud, Lord. He has fulfilled scripture. And Lord, we are so thankful that we have a, a, a God, you Father, who loved us enough to send your son to die for us. And Father, just like John the Baptist, Lord, some here, some listening, may feel abandoned by God. They may feel abandoned by you, Lord. I pray, Father, that by the time we're finished here, that they understand that you who called them before the foundation of the world would never leave them or never forsake them. But Father, it's a warning to those who do not know you, Lord, that ultimately... If they reject your son, they will be abandoned by you. And Father, I pray that the preaching of your word by this mere man would bring glory to your name. And may the one who does not know you as Lord and Savior come to saving faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we begin our look here at Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, I, I want to bring to your mind a similar event in scripture do you remember the story of the two disciples as they walked along the road to, to Emmaus that's the same day Jesus had risen from the dead that event is recorded in Luke chapter 24 as you read that story you can't help but notice the disappointment and questions that they felt over Jesus death without their knowing it Jesus had risen from the dead in victory but their eyes were restrained and they didn't know that he had come alongside the road boldly and walked with them they were mourning his death and as they strolled along this fellow traveler Jesus himself asked them why they were so sad and they they were astonished at the question, do you remember that? They were walking and they, and they were shocked by this question that this stranger would ask them. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and be crucified him. But we have hoped, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. And moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And that's what we read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 19 through 24. Now I want you to think for a moment the disappointment and doubt that they expressed. Who were two men who, who believed in Jesus, had seen Him teach. They trusted in Him. They thought He was the Messiah. They said, but we had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. You see, they, like so many of that day were expecting Jesus to be a conquering victorious Messiah that the Jewish people were hoping for and had long been expecting. Don't, 
Don't miss that. We need, need, never need to forget that. See, we have the privilege and honor of looking back in time. You can imagine if you were a, a person who had followed Christ and you had read the Scriptures and you were familiar with the Scriptures and knew that He would come back and He would be the conquering Messiah. And He would set up His kingdom. This is important when we get to the question of what John was thinking. And so these two men give us a glimpse of what the thought was. They were looking for him to be that mighty military and political leader, just as we are. Folks, don't think this is so hard to grasp because aren't we anticipating that as well? Aren't we anticipating the, the time that Jesus comes back? He calls his church home and he, then the tribulation period. And then we have the battle of Armageddon. And Christ's return, and what will he do? He will be the conquering hero. He will be on a white horse and come, and, and we will be with him. And then he will do what? He will set up a perfect kingdom for a thousand years. We're all expecting that. They were expecting that. And it didn't happen right then. Instead, what happened? The Jesus, the one upon whom they had pinned their hopes, was crucified on a humiliating Roman cross like a common criminal and all their expectations of him were cut short, done away with. The disappointment, the abandonment they must have felt at that moment. And yet, ironically, there he was. Standing right next to him. He was alive, walking along with them and having a conversation with them. As we read on we find that even he even rebukes them for misunderstanding the situation as it really was he says and he said to them oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken you realize how many times god has called you foolish if you don't think he has he has every time you doubt him every time you question what he's doing in your life oh foolish mark oh foolish mark you have my word and yet you question, you constantly question if I have the best interest at, at heart for you. You see, Christian, when you live a life that's wholly pleasing to God, when you are inside of Christ's will and you are seeking his will in your life, there's nothing for you to fear. God will sustain you and keep you. These two men that they were disappointed and had doubts about Jesus, you see, because he hadn't fulfilled their expectations. You know, when Jesus, when you feel abandoned by Christ, if you're a Christian, he's let you down. You feel like he's let you down, and he hasn't fulfilled your expectations. You see, how many expectations do we have of Christ that aren't biblical? And see, we, we, we think somehow that we deserve to have this life, that there's no conflict, no pain, no suffering. You know, I was just reading in 1 Timothy Kathy and I do our devotions every morning together and praying, and I, and I just love just, just reading the Word. Just not, don't have to sit down and write a sermon from it, just my personal devotion time, and just writing and just, just reading it, not even taking notes, just reading God's Word. And you know what really hit me? He said to Timothy, I want you to think about this for just a moment, he said, be content if you have clothes and food. Whoa, 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 what would you just say, preacher? He said, be content if you have food and clothes. Well, wait a minute. Well, wait a minute, Lord. I, I am a 21st century American. I got to have nice clothes. I got to drive a nice car. I got to have a nice house. Then I'll be content. No. You see, the problem is, Christians, we don't learn, we don't understand what contentment is in Christ. And I'm afraid one, one of these days, not in the near too distant future we're going to experience that as christians this year toward the past year 2020 was nothing but a a cutting off of the fat it was it was uh, it was getting rid of the tears in a lot of churches people will not stay when the times get tough but those who are content in clothing and food god promises that he will take care of you in that way you have nothing to fear even if it's in prison even if it's in prison, to be used by him. So he, he rebukes these two. He rebukes them for not having the right expectations and for not believing what the Scriptures had said would happen to them. And so he began speaking to them from the writings of Moses. I love this. And 
he goes on throughout the rest of Scripture, point by point, he proved to them that in the dying on the cross, he actually fulfilled everything the Scriptures promised concerning the Messiah. Could you imagine? Can you imagine how glorious it would have been to hear Jesus preach to you? Here you are walking with him. He has been crucified and he has been buried. It's the third day. You don't see him anywhere. And here's Jesus standing next to them. And I, and I could almost see him smiling on the inside. And he said, let me tell you about this Messiah. And he preaches to them. He preaches to them. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, it tells us that their hearts burned within them as he opened the scriptures to them. Does your heart burn when the scriptures are read? When the preaching of the word is convicting to you, uh, when this mere man stands and preaches and the Holy Spirit convicts, it's not me that's convicting you, by the way. Don't ever blame me for that. Okay? Don't, I, I, I love it when people say to me, Pastor, you were in my living room last night. No, I wasn't. And I don't have any mics or bugs in your house. And nobody called me up to say, hey, hey, preacher, would you say this about my husband tonight, please? That, that doesn't happen. It's the Holy Spirit that's using his word to convict. And these two men saw that. And I believe that they began to see that the problem wasn't him, but with them. Like it is in our lives. They had not believed what the scriptures had said concerning him. And so they had come to expect him to do things that he had never promised he would do. Do you ever use scripture to beat people up with it and you don't beat yourself up with it? You have an expectation of what God has for others, but you don't hold yourself to that same measuring stick. God gives us his word for us to live life by. This, this is all that you need to live a life that's holy and pleasing to God. And yet so many of us don't even pick this up, don't read it, don't care about it, don't, don't treasure it the way we should. I love God's word. I, I couldn't be a preacher of God's word if I didn't love it. I love to, to open it up, to read it, to study it. And so I ask you this morning, have you ever been disappointed with Jesus? Have you ever been disappointed with Jesus? Did you ever approach him with a set of expectations and find that he did not fulfill them the way you wanted him to? Have you ever felt that Jesus has let you down, that he's abandoned you? I'm so glad that God recorded the events in this morning's passage of Scripture, what, we're re what I read to you. And at first glance, it seems like it places John the Baptist in a bad light, doesn't it? If you look at it, you know, if you're, careful, if you're not careful, you just kind of read over this like we have a tendency to do a lot of times. But, but understand the man, John the Baptist, and, and, it, and Scripture even, it looks like, why is he doubting Christ? Why would he do that? See, it tells us of how the man who was appointed by God to be the greatest advocate for Jesus in his earthly ministry, a man who in fact had been prophesied in the Old Testament, testament scriptures as the forerunner and herald of the lord's earthly ministry and he expressed a growing sense of disappointment and doubt and abandonment by him so christian you're not alone when you feel those things even the mighty john the baptist had doubts and yet the lord took his doubts seriously and he answered them and what the Lord told him in this passage gives encouragement to the rest of us who have had those times, the same doubts, those times when Jesus seems to disappoint us, when he seems to be in distance from us, and he's, because he's not meeting our expectations, we think he's left us. And so this morning, I want to talk about two details that confirm the identity of the Messiah. It's identity questioned and the identity confirmed. Read with me again, draw your attention to the verse two verses. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went out from there to teach and preach in the cities. And now when John heard on, in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And they said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? So in verse 1, we can assume that after Jesus gives all the instructions and warnings to the 12, which we have gone over in the weeks past, they went out preaching and healing as they were commanded. They left. They went. So they're gone, and they see that Jesus, and then we see that Jesus began to teach and preach in the cities that, that is in the cities of Galilee. They went, and then he did his preaching ministry. The people of Israel didn't receive him or repent at his teachings. As a result, look what happens in verse chapter eleven, verse twenty. Uh, go find that verse, chapter eleven, down in verse twenty. Go down there with me. 
And it says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Corsian! Woe to you, Besida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So we have here that Jesus went out and preached and they rejected him. Christian, don't feel bad when people reject you. They rejected the one that sent you. The one that sends you out, they have rejected. They rejected him. You are his sent ones. And he was sent by God himself. And they rejected him. Why do you think that they're going to love you? Do you, ever, do you ever fret and frown and get upset when people mock you or make fun of you or don't want to listen to you when you start talking about the gospel? Why should we act like it's some kind of surprise that they do? And folks, we, we should not fear man, but fear God. See, you would have expected on a strictly human level that the Messiah would have been warmly received, wouldn't he? By those who were waiting for him. You would have thought he would be. Look at all the things he had done already. His word would have, the word of what he had done and healing all that he had done would have gotten out. But that's not what happened. And the Bible prophesied long ago that such would be the case. And Isaiah, chapter 53, 1 through 3, it's one of the most, it's one of the clearest messianic prophecies in all of Scripture. Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we dis esteemed him not. Did Jesus laugh? I'm sure he did. Did he smile? Sure he did. But he's not referred to in Scripture by those terms. He's referred to as a man of sorrow. Could you imagine being God incarnate and you look around and see the evil of man? Man's inhumanity to the man. God who can look inside the hearts of every man, know what they're thinking and doing. And Jesus, as He walks, He's a man of sorrow, as He's come to save these people, and He stands and He preaches, and He talks about the coming kingdom, and He preaches repentance, and they reject Him, and He laments further on in chapter 11, it'll be worse for you than the city of Sodom. God destroyed Sodom. Remember that story? I, you know, that's a good one to go back and, and read again. Remember how Abraham pleaded? Pleaded. If you, if you find, and I don't have the numbers right because I didn't even look at the passage before I got up here and I should have. But, you know, he starts off with that number and then 50 and then he goes down 25. And then and if you, could you just, Lord, I don't want to push you any further. But if you just find 10 righteous people in this whole city, would you save the city? And he says, okay, 10 people, I'll save it. But there weren't ten righteous. And yet God says that it'll be worse for those who've heard the gospel and reject it. If you're listening online this morning, I see it's the advantage of being in a church when there's only a few people here and I look at every one of your faces. You can't hide from me today. And I know your testimonies for most of you. Some of you younger ones in here I don't know. But I look around and I see believers. I see people who love the Lord. I, I see people who have a desire and hunger and thirst after Him. But online... As I'm looking into the camera, I don't know who's watching, who's listening. And I'm going to tell you, if you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will be worse for you than it was for the city of Sodom. So in verse 2, we see that John sends out his disciples now. So verse 1, Jesus went out and preached. They rejected him. In verse 2, we see that John sends out disciples to question him. Remember, John has been thrown in prison back in Matthew chapter 4. And may have been in prison 
a quite some time now. We don't know exactly, but we know he's been there. He had served faithfully as God's prophet. He had even been confronted. He even confronted open sin in the life of the king. He, he would not tolerate what the king was doing. He had confront, confronted Herod because Herod had married his, the wife of his own brother in disobedience of Scripture. You know, isn't it, isn't it funny? I'm going to stop here just for a second. Somebody would look at that today and goes, well, it's a big deal. So we married somebody's divorce. Do you understand that God takes his word seriously? And because we live in the year 21, uh, 2021, he doesn't say that homosexuality now is okay. He doesn't say fornication is okay. He doesn't say adultery is okay because it makes you feel better. He doesn't say that you can get married two, three, four, five, six times and not care about what you're doing. His word is the same. His word was the same yesterday. His word is the same today, and it'll be the same tomorrow. It doesn't change because we change. And it's, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame that we as Christians don't, don't stand on that. What are we teaching one another? What are we saying to, to somebody who's a brother or sister in Christ in their open rebellion against God? I, re, I remember years ago, uh, when, when I asked the help of a man in our church, I was dealing with a, a situation and I asked him to help me to go to somebody that he knew and loved. And he, he just said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. They're just young people. They're going to do what they do. I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken. You see, when, when we don't confront... See, I love what Pastor Jamie says. He says, I love people enough that I'm going to confront their sin. You see, we look at it the opposite. We look at it, well, I don't want to confront anybody because I love them and, and, and they may not like me. But you know, when you really love somebody, you care about them. And you care about them spiritually, especially when they're a brother and sister. Christ. See, we're not to judge the world. What the world does, they do. It's not your place to judge what they do. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we are told to judge one another. And I pray that you judge me. If I, if I need to be held accountable just like every other person in this room. We are, we, are, we are fallible men and women. And we need the love of a body of Christ. And with that said, can I, can I just take a moment and say thank you, Grace Harvest Baptist Church. Can I say thank you to the men and women of this church for them responding in, in love this week to a hurting family member of our family, the Wyants. I, I just, I was overcome. You know, when, when you go to a visiting church, when you go visit another church, and uh, I, I commend Pastor Lee Day and his people, what a, how gracious they were to us and how loving and kind. Pastor Cal uh, shared with me how they went over there and worked on sound, and they were there late in the evening, past 10 o'clock, and the pastor of that church was there with them. That's a, that's a blessing. And you know what he said to me on, when I was driving, getting ready to drive off to go to the gravesite? He said, Pastor, he said, you make sure you tell your people what a blessing they were to be, have contact with them. Not one person that I came in contact from your church complained. All I saw was the love of Christ come out of them and their desire to serve. You know what that makes you feel like when you're pastor of that church? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And he said, and it's true, he said, that's a reflection on the leadership, but I didn't take it as a reflection on me as much as you. You. The elders were on the bottom, the deacons are there next, and then it's you people. You, 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 you my brothers and sisters in Christ, you are the ones that make us look good. Yeah, I'm the one standing up here, I'm the one that's on TV right now, but you are the ones. We all are the insignificant ones we talked about last week that God is using for his glory. And, and this week, you guys were, you, you made your pastor so humbled and so proud this week to see you reach in love. There were people in our church that didn't even know the Wyatts. And yet they were serving over at the firehouse. Glory. To him be the glory for it. So as we get back to the passage today, and we look at it in Luke in this gospel, uh, puts it this way about what Herod had done. It says, Herod, who had been reproved by him 
for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done. That wasn't the only thing he'd done that was evil. And he added this to them all, and they locked him, John, in prison. That's what the world does when you confront sin. They don't want to hear it and put you out. Try to think with me what it might have been going on in John's mind as he sat in prison for being a faithful prophet of God. And remember, this isn't our jails. This is rat-infested, waste everywhere. People have been there. And when you went to jail in those days, you went to jail to die. It wasn't like they sentenced you to 30 days in jail and they let you out. For the most part, you went to jail, you were going to die. And so he's in this pitiful condition in jail. And he has, a, has this question. He knew that he indeed been sent by God as the one crying in the wilderness. He knew that it was given by God for him to announce the coming Messiah. And to the point Jesus out to the to people when he declared, Behold... Remember that when he said the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? And what's more, he knew that this coming one would be the conquering and victorious Messiah. He told people who came to be baptized him, I, I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Christian, you're the wheat. And he will gather you into the barn. The warning is to the chaff that will be burnt up. You know, the men this morning, we were reading in Psalms and I couldn't help but notice when we were there and we came across a passage and it talked about the ungodly, how they're gnashing their teeth in anger at God. One day, the chaff, the ones who have abandoned God and, do, and rejected the Son, they will be so angry in hell and blaming God and shaking their fist out of them and they'll be in total darkness and they'll be in agony, and they'll still be gnashing their teeth at God. It's a warning. And yet, as John is languishing away in prison, he couldn't help but notice that the mighty conquest does not seem to have happened yet. Wait a minute, I'm sitting here. He is the chosen one. I... I, I witnessed his baptism. I performed his baptism. Why isn't everything going to plan? His disciples had apparently told him what Jesus was doing, but it wasn't going the way he thought it was supposed to go. Remind you of anybody else? Maybe yourself? God may not be moving in your timing. Where is this unquenchable fire? Where's this winnowing fork in his hand and, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat to the barn? These things Jesus was doing were certainly wonderful, but, but they weren't meeting John's expectations of what the Messiah would do. He expected Jesus to be riding into Israel on this white stallion. Do you remember that John apparently couldn't tell that Jesus was the Son of God just by looking? You don't miss that. It took an act of the Holy Spirit to identify him to John. John chapter 1, verse 33 through 34. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes the Holy Spirit. John didn't even know him. Didn't recognize him. And when Jesus came to John to be baptized him, John clearly didn't expect it. Because he said, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me, he said. In fact, Jesus didn't even act how John thought the Messiah should act. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 14, John's disciples once came to Jesus and asked, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? That John, John and his disciples didn't think Jesus was doing what they, he should be doing. And now... John sits and rots in prison and sees that Jesus was not even behaving like the conquering Messiah that he should be and that all, all of Israel expected. Perhaps now, then you can relate to John's doubts and growing disappointments when you read 
And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? So now I think you get a clear understanding of what John was thinking. So we've identified the question. Now let's look at the identity confirmed. Verse 4, And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good, good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And I love how Jesus deals with John's doubts. I, I, I love it. He's, he's basically screaming at him without screaming at him. He loved John and respected his sincere question. Our Lord didn't rebuke John. He didn't, ask, he didn't say, John, shame on you for asking this question. Like he did the two guys on the road to Emmaus. But he did give him the answer he needed. So I ask you this question. Do you bring your doubts to the Lord or do you just get angry at him? That's a strange question, preacher. Yeah, because sometimes you get angry at God and you don't even talk to him. Do you ever cry out to the Lord on your hands and knees? Have you ever gotten on the floor of your prayer closet, your bathroom, your living room floor when nobody else is around in your bedroom and cried out to God with your doubts and fears? You ever done that? Or are you so prideful that you won't even bend the knee to the one who saved you? Do you bring your cares and concerns to one another? Your pastors, your elders are here to hear your needs and your concerns as you cry out to the lord we're here to help you get through all the valleys and the and 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 the 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 issues that go on with us in this world you see the great thing about a body of christ is we're not like the world we have one another and the bond that we have is the greatest bond that a man and woman can ever know with a brother and sister in Christ, it's because we serve the same Father, we are going to the same place, and we're all ambassadors. You are an army, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you're an army, you're one another. You know, I hear it all the time. We talked about this on Saturday. Uh, a matter of fact, I, I thought maybe we talked about it a little too much. But we were talking about the police officers that are gathered here, we were talking about love, and, and we, were, we were saying... It was a funny thing that was brought up. One of the men said that, you know, um, when, I, when I was in police work and I was on the SWAT team, you know, I, 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 I instantly cared about those guys because I could trust them. And, and, I w- and, and you know, we did everything together and we, we trust them. And, and we have a problem with trusting others, right? Sometimes we don't know what they're going to do. Christians, we should have a bond that's just like they have in combat. You all have heard those testimonies before. You know, a guy says, you know, you can keep all that patriotic stuff. When I was fighting, you know who I was concerned about? It was the guy right next to me. This guy, and that guy, and this guy, and that guy. And everybody that belonged to my unit. That's who I was fighting for. Christian, you should have that same attitude with the body here at Grace Harvest. We serve the Lord, but we are called to serve Him together with one another. When Pastor Cal said, and, and, and uh, Tom, and we were talking, and, and uh, I was sitting here thinking about the fellowship that we had before, and Pastor Cal said something about it, Tom said it during, right during the prayer time. I know y'all miss it just as much as I do, because I hear it all the time. Pastor, when are we going back one service? Well, we plan on doing that in April. I tell you what, I wish we'd do it next week, but we're going we're gonna to wait for the building to be finished when we go. And, and I'm looking forward to that time when our brothers and sisters in Christ can look at each other. There's some in here that you may not, if you come to the 830 service, you may not even know some of the people who joined the church. Because they, they, they I don't know what God's, God's bringing us all these people that go to the late service. But anyway, <laughs> I guess they like to sleep in. But we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we need to go to each other when we have doubts. When we, when we need prayer. 
All of us have doubted at some point because that's what the enemy wants you to do. See, the enemy of God wants to whisper in your ear, your God doesn't really care about you. He, he doesn't care about you. If he cared about you, this wouldn't happen to you. And, it, and we're just human, and if we let it go there, and that's why it's so important to stay in the Word. That's why it's so important to have a, a Paul in your life and a Timothy in your life. What, is, what do I mean by that? You should have somebody mature in the faith. Ladies, you should have an older woman that's mature in the faith, the, the one that comes alongside of you and helps you walk. And then you should, you should have a woman that is less mature than you, and you're helping her on her journey. Men, same thing. You know, I, I'm fortunate. I have the elders and I have the uh, pastors here that, that uh, help me be held accountable and that I can share my heart with. And, and you guys know me. I'll share my heart right from this pulpit, so it's not like I won't share it with you. But it, it's, it's good that I have that so that I can do that and I call you know, I talk to Pastor Cal and Pastor Jamie every day when here in the office, but I'll call the other elders and talk. I told Brian how sweet it was just to be able to spend some time with him. He's, he's on this schedule that he works, and I'm always afraid to bother him, but, you know, he, he always returns my calls. I don't ever worry about bothering them. People don't worry about bother calling the pastors or the elders up. You're not bothering us. I always tell people, if I don't answer, it's because I'm busy. But call. Don't think you're bothering us. We're there for one another. And so Jesus says now, after John has these doubts, and he brings them to him. So Jesus says, go and tell John what you see. Go tell, go tell John in prison what you see and hear. Although Jesus did nothing to relieve John's physical confinement and suffering. Notice that. Christian, notice that he did not bust John out of jail. He did not do that. John still suffered physically. But what he gave him was reassurance that John had baptized the Messiah. He did send back to him this special confirmation, and we indeed, that he was indeed performing messianic works. These, of course, were all the things Jesus had done. The disciples of John saw some of it with their own eyes, and they heard the testimony of much which was done from others. And I remind you that you and I have the same testimony recorded to us in Scripture so that we too might believe in Him. They were there. I love, I love in Scripture. You see but blessed are those who don't see me and they believe. That's you, Christian. That's you. You understand? God has blessed you because you have believed in Him and know Him as Lord and Savior. It's easy to believe in something you see. Think about your faith. How glorious your faith is. I want you to stop and think about it. You have faith greater than the apostles. Because they saw. And remember, they knew that Jesus said he would be raised on the third day. And the women came out and said, and I love, I love the women in Scripture. They put the men to shame like they do at Grace Harvest most of the time. Lord, I mean, uh, men, we, we've seen him. He's not there. No, nah, no, nah, no, nah, that can't be true. And yet when you believed, the scales from your eyes were removed. And you believed in your heart that Jesus was the Son of God who died for your sins and took the wrath of God upon Himself, the payment that you could never pay. He paid, and you believed. And you can sit here this morning with, and you can sing those songs, All I Have is Christ. You see, there were every Jewish person who was truly paying attention and knew the Scriptures would have remembered such passages as Isaiah chapter 29, verse 17 18, as it promised, it was the promise of the glorious days of the coming Messiah. We read there in Isaiah 29, 17 and 18, it is not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day, 
In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. They would know that what Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 4 and 6. Isaiah 35, verse 4 and 6. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance. With the recompense of God, He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing with joy. For water breaks forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. John would remember what was recorded in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, where the Messiah himself prophetically speaks words that Jesus once even clearly attributed to himself during his earthly ministry. We read in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to opening up the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. See, I believe that when the disciples of John went back and told John these things that we have read this morning, when he heard them and he saw his, his disciples telling them them, John remembered all these promises from the book of Isaiah. You see, Christian, when you get disheartened, and when you feel abandoned, go to the Word of God because His promises are real and they don't, they're not null and void because of our circumstances and the way we feel. I believe that the connection that he would have made, John would have made in his mind to the promise of the book of Isaiah would, would have also reminded him of another set of promises made there concerning the Messiah's suffering. Perhaps John's mind would have gone back to Isaiah 53 where it says this about the coming one. Turn in your books, in your Bibles with me. Let's find the book of Isaiah. And I want to read Isaiah 53 to you. It's a familiar passage to many. And it's one always worth repeating. Isaiah 53, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief and one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and, he was este and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He, is a pr he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that had... That before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And so for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was all, excuse me, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, may many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many 
and makes intercession for the transgressors. Christian, when you start feeling sorry for yourself, read Isaiah 53. And remember what God's Son has done for you and I. I believe our doubts and disappointments with Jesus begin to disappear, disappear when we realize He is so much greater than our own expectations. He fulfills all His promises, but always does so in ways that are greater than we could ever imagine. To John and to all who have mistaken the expectations of Jesus that He does not fulfill, He says, And blessed is the one who is not offended by Me. When Jesus disappoints someone's illegitimate expectations of Him, it's easy for them to turn away from Him. It's easy for them to think that He has let them down, and so they want nothing more to do with Him. Many, as you know, have said just that. And Paul says they were never a part of us when they left because they were never of us. But here Jesus encourages that man or woman who is in Him never to give up. Do not be ashamed of Him. There's a lesson for us in this. Sometimes our doubts and disappointments come through the experiences that we have to live through each and every day. But God will send even your own brothers and sisters in Christ to walk by your side when you're going through those valleys. We've seen it here time and time and time again. Perhaps there are times when doubts about Jesus are meant to be taken away through the eyewitness accounts of friends or loved ones who can testify from personal experience that Jesus truly is the Son of God. I don't know how many times I've said when I'm, I'm going through either counseling with a married couple or an individual and they're suffering and they can't understand why they're going through the suffering and, and, and I tell them, just like I told those gathered in the funeral, I cannot tell you why God took Amber home. But I can tell you this, it was in His sovereign will. Nothing is caught outside of His knowledge. It didn't surprise Him. And I tell people all the time, what you go through now, one day, a year from now, five years from now, or ten years from now, that what you went through, that sorrow you went through, that pain and anguish you went through, you can put your arm around a brother or sister in Christ and say, can I walk this valley with you? I've walked with, I've walked this valley. And you know, Pastor Mark walked me through this, or Pastor Cal walked me through this, or Pastor Jamie walked me through this. And I want to show you how you can walk through this. Let me pray with you. Let me be there for you. You see, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you go through these things in life just not, not by accident. <laughs> God uses them to mold you, to make you have stronger faith in Him, and also to be used by Him. I want to close with this today. And, and I, I, I came to these final thoughts after I, I had already written the funeral a, a sermon, and then because of what God laid on my heart about the funeral, I want to say there are those who need to fear that God will abandon them. And Christian, you need, never need to fear that because He will not abandon you. But there are those who need to fear God abandoning them. And those are the ones who do not know Him. You know, in Romans, for the sake of time, I won't go there, but I will write this down and read it later. Romans chapter 1, 24 through 32, it tells us that God gave them up to the lust of their hearts and turned them over to perverse sexual things and turned them over because you know why? God abandoned them. God abandoned them. And one day, when that person dies, the one who's rejected God, God will look at them and say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And He will cast them into the lake of fire where they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and ever, where the fire never dies and light will never shine. And what say you who are listening this morning? If you were to die, if this was your last day, are you at peace? 
Are you at peace knowing that you have put your faith and trust and you can say, as Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain? Or are you that person right now who feels abandoned by God because you don't know Him? Well, there's still hope. As long as there's breath in your lungs, there's still hope for you to repent, turn from your sins, and trust in the one who can save you, and that's Jesus. He's the one that can save you. And my prayer is that you would search and seek God with all your heart. Cry out to Him, for He's the only one that can save you. Father, I thank You so much for the blessing that You have given me the privilege you have given me to stand in this pulpit, Lord, and to preach your word. Father, I have been just like John. I have sat in my own prison that I have made and doubted, Lord, that you really care about me. But Father, I'm so thankful, Lord, that the Holy Spirit that resides in me quickly reminds me, Lord, when I start to feel that way, that doesn't come from you, that comes from the enemy. Because, Father, you will never leave me nor forsake me. You who have called me before the foundation of the world, you who, who formed me in my mother's womb, you who numbered my days, Lord, and I stand here today to preach only by your grace. And as my brothers and sisters that are gathered here and online, Lord, you also have called them and you have saved them by your grace. Nothing we have done will ever earn a, we could do could earn our salvation, Lord. You've shown us mercy, and we're so thankful for that. Now that we have the good news, Lord, now that we know that the blind see and the lame walk and the lepers are healed, Lord, the dead are raised, Father, may we live lives that reflect that belief. May we not cower and hide from a lost and dying world, but may we be bold in our proclamation of the gospel. Lord, may we have such a heart's desire to see the lost come to you, Father, that the first thing we think of in the morning is those in our families and those that we love and the friends that we've been in contact with or the stranger that we met would be the first thing that comes to our mind to make sure we're praying for their salvation. And Lord, may that be the last thing as we go to bed. Be thinking about those, Lord, who are abandoned by you right now, but Father, you are reaching out to them. Father, may you receive the glory for all that has gone on here today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, this morning, it is my privilege on this wintry wonderland. By the way, I sent my brother-in-law a text this morning as I was driving in. I took a picture of the blizzard conditions on 360 and sent it to my brother-in-law who lives in Minnesota. And I said, look, we got blizzards out here in Virginia as well. He just laughed, ha, 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 ha. But I thank all of you who came out today. And, and uh, this morning, um, I want to welcome 